For financial and practical reasons, art galleries and museums have traditionally favored the experience of a sighted audience. This ocular-centric approach extends not only to the experience of visual artworks themselves, but also to the architectural, spatial design of most art galleries and museums, as well as the discourses surrounding the experience of art, including signage within the gallery, artist label, etc. Consequently, museums use to categorize visitors reachable through conventional mediation practices, the general public, students, experts, etc. However, this led to social inequity as people who did not fit into one of these specific groups were then considered a non-public by cultural institutions. Visually impaired and blind visitors provide a case in point. Most of the visual information in artworks have long been hidden to them. In museology and mediation, one of the concepts that causes much controversy is that of non-publics, that is, audiences that do not have access to culture for various reasons. The authors do not seem to agree on the definition of this notion, which is as just as vague as of the term public. While the Encyclopedic Dictionary of Museology describes the non-audience as those who do not visit the museums, but still benefit from it through off-site activities, Professor Emeritus Daniel Jacobi and Professor Jason Lukaroff consider this group to be those who do not constitute the museum's public and therefore do not participate in its activities. Since 2015, the emergence of new accessibility policies has made a major contribution to reversing this trend by encouraging museums to also address these impeded audiences, that is, those placed in different situations of, ex of social exclusion due to their disability. This desire to increase accessibility and access to culture is reflected, among other things, in the development of new forms of mediation. Thus, more options are now offered to the visually impaired and blind people and free audio guides adapted towards drawing and plan in relief, descriptions in braille, etc. Museums and institutions are also showing up openness by gradually restoring the place that once belonged to touch as a mean of aesthetic apprehension. They thus recognize the impact of tactile mediation on the visitor experience. But what are others doing in the world about this accessibility issue? Endowed with a policy of presenting casting since the 1980s, the Sculpture Department of the Louvre is one of the first major museums to have given an important place to touch in its mediation. Indeed, the Louvre has taken an interest in these issue of access by seeking to reach non-traditionally acquired audiences, such as people with vision problems, as early as the 1990s. According to Geneviève dresque bautier the first tactile gallery presented at the Musée d'Art et d'Essai at the Palais de Tokyo, Visage de l'Homme, foreshadowed the establishment of a tactile gallery at the Louvre. The exhibition was coordinated by the director of the Louvre Sculpture Department at the time, Jean-René Gabory, and included three identical casts of the same bus arranged on several tables to encourage dialogue between visitors. Even though adapted guided tours are already scheduled on the closing, of the, on this closing day of the museum, this tactile gallery offers a closer relationship with the works and this contact allow visitors to take ownership of the culture. This tactile gallery has also the advantage of being an interest to all audiences and not just the public initially targeted by tactile mediation. Thus, with the work of the Grand Louvre, the sculpture department moved to the ground floor of the Denon Wing in the 1994, and it was in this context that it, it was decided to create a parallel gallery, the tactile gallery at the Louvre. Opened in 1995, this gallery originally consisted of, of about 20 plasters cast uh, reproducing the department's great, great masterpieces, all accompanied by large prints and braille labels. A specific audio guide was also made available to visitors in order to help them better understand the subtlety between the different sculptural style presented. As a result, and perhaps also because of its success, this exhibition created expectations in visitors with vision problems, which was not the case before. In recent years, other museums, inspired by the initiative of the Louvre, have adapted new technologies in order to design a multi-sensory mediation. This is the case of the Europa Sim Museum in Rome, which since March 2017 has been offering its visually impaired and blind visitors an experience that combines touch and earring simultaneously, the Art for the Blind project. Combining technology and art, this new experience includes four elements that are essential to the discovery of an important monument of Imperial Rome and the works of the museum. An iPad mini, a thermoformed relief map of the museum, 
tags associated with Braille word writing and a magnetic, magnetic loop or ring. Um, the second pair of tool is complementary since the magnetic loop recognizes the electronic tag associated with Braille writing when it is close to them. In fact, as the visitor passes near a word, the loop automatically selects and launches the audio description associated with it. This loop can also be worn on the finger or hung on the shoulder strap of the bag containing the connected digital tablet that completes the device. The innovative project demonstrates a relevant use of new technologies and gives the impression that uh, the impression of following a guided tour customized according to the route one takes. A good level of autonomy is thus achieved which, uh, since the content adapts and updates as the visitor moves through the museum space. The use of digital technology does make it possible to transform the visit to the Arapati Museum into a memorable experience for all visitors, sighted and blind alike, young and old. This is a real success story in terms of social inclusion and blind, of blind and visually impaired people who are no longer sidelined. In the ne Netherlands, the Van Gogh Museum stands out in terms of tactile initiatives for visually impaired and blind people. Of particular interest is the Feeling Van Gogh project, which offers an interactive guided tour followed by a multisensory workshop where the artist's work can be seen through touch. Indeed, the Van Gogh Museum has developed digital copies of the work, which it then had printed in relief using a 3D printer. In order to give the visitor a better understanding of the artist's technique, the prints reveal a tactile copy of Van Gogh in pastel and brush strokes. These works are part of the Reliefo collection and are certainly the pillar of this, this adapted mediation. Here, no gloves are needed to touch these reproductions, which allow for uh, cl even closer contact with the works. Furthermore, the colors are reproduced identically, which makes the project more interesting for visually impaired audiences who are nevertheless able to perceive certain elements. During my master's in art history at Université de Montréal, uh, I came up with the idea of creating two tactile prototypes to translate the colors and the content of a painting. Prototype development create, raises several questions related to the notion of interpretation, the translation, as well as the equivalences that a blind person could be missing. Are both prototype tactile copies or interpretation of the original artwork? One may also ask whether these are more of a tactile interpretation serving as mediation tool, or if they are the result of a so-called intersemiotic translation manifesting itself within a graphical pictorial continuum. These notions of great relevance to our project will enable us to carry, a, carry out a theoretical analysis of the color translation device, in addition to leading us to reflect on how the symbolic message accompanied by a linguistic message could guide the visitor throughout the tactile interpre interpretation of the chosen artwork. The aim of this research is therefore to identify new ways of enriching and diversifying access to pictorial artworks for the visually impaired public and to involve them as direct players in the prototype development process. An intersemiotic translation is a form of translation that does not include the transition from one natural language to another natural language, but rather the translation of different semiotic systems. The term graphical pictorial here refers to signs and traces made on two-dimensional surfaces. One of the first challenges in the project was to select the right artwork. While this might seem an easy task at first, um, it's it, it has proven to be more challenging than it was um, because you have to think about an artwork that could be easily translated in terms of its narrative and then also in terms of its color. So maybe for a first uh, project, uh, an artwork from an impressionist artist would not have been deemed reasonable. Uh, with that in mind, I decided to go along with uh, an artwork from a Quebec artist, which is Alfred Pellan's Prisme Dieu exhibition banner created in 1948 which um, is exhibited at the Montreal Museum of, Fi of Fine Art. The goal of selecting this artwork was to maybe uh, address uh, the question of our national and cultural identity in the hope of having the participant being more implicated in the project and in building the prototype. Thinking about this concept of a painting by number, which really uh, structured my 
my, my childhood, I wanted to come up with the concept of creating a different texture for different, for different colors. So it would be a texture color association. Um, the reason behind that would be to have a tactile distinct, distinction uh, between the different colors. So to do so, I came up with the idea of using 3D printing. So we created textures that would be uh, printed in uh, soft silicone, hard silicone, and also in plastic. Early on, uh, it was decided that this project could not continue without the input of people who were visually impaired and blind. So we selected uh, some participants or collaborators, should I say, uh, who contributed to the project by giving their opinion on the different textures. And pretty early on, they decided that the textures that were printed in plastic uh, should be eliminated because they were not uh, they were not nice to touch and they could feel the lines of the printer, which they did not uh, appreciate. Um, so then we had a selection of textures and we would ask them in a very really random, I mean, it's, it's an experiential project, so it would be experiential all the way. So I would ask which texture is red and why is that? Which texture is white and why is that? And over all the participants, more than half came up with the same texture for the same color. So this was very interesting because it seems to be uh, that they have a tactile hierarchy of the color that would be associated with emotions. So for example, red would be associated with passion and would have to be a higher texture than white, which is reminded them of snow and waiting in the winter. So that was an interesting discovery. Of course, this would not be uh, a possible solution for a universal uh, the texture chart, but it was an interesting discovery that they tend to associate emotion with textures. As a result of meeting with the collaborators, um, we had two prototypes. So the first one was the first step, which enabled the participants to recognize and uh, identify the different elements contained in the narrative of the painting. The second step then included the colors. So a few mistakes were made on the road, and one of them was to have the, the black lines, the outlines in the second prototype, on the same level as the textures for the colors. Um, so we quickly realized that it was being confusing for the participant to read the, the prototype. So we would have to bring it back into the lab and raise the outline for a couple of millimeters, just so it would, me, it would make a distinction more easily doable for them. To accompany the prototype and to make sure that the uh, visually impaired visitors would be autonomous in the museum, uh, I decided to create a tactile legend that would represent different colors. So for example, in that one, we wanted to see if um, you could use one technology, that is 3D printing, to create the legend as well as the textures. So the problem that arrived is that uh, you need to have a certain distance between each dot. So when I presented this prototype to the participants, some of them started laughing because they couldn't read it out. Um, they said that it looked like Braille for kids who didn't know how to read Braille or were learning to, le to read it. So we quickly decided to go back to the lab and to fix this issue. That's when we came up with the second version of the legend, which included a uh, Braille that was done by a, an association for blind and visually impaired uh, in Montreal. So that's that time, uh, the participants were really able to read um, the, the colors and to recognize them by themselves. However, one thing that the first legend showed up is that since it was bigger, it was particularly interesting for people who lost sight because of diabetes. Since they lost sensitivity in their fingers, they were more easily able to read Braille that was bigger and more spaced. So this is something to keep in mind, and maybe since not everyone is not learning Braille these days, um, an audio legend would have been a better solution. Painting is an art form that engages visitors in a slightly more distant relationship within the work, forcing them to resort to visualization in order to appreciate its content, including its colors. However, some people do not have access to the painting that constitute an important part of its artistic production, and the development of other mediation tools seems to be justified here by this need. Considering these facts, the objective of my research work is to test the feasibility of a tactile translation or interpretation of visual data for an audience with vision impairments. Although color is subjective, the preliminary results of my research have shown that it seems possible to perform a tactile interpretation 
of a painting scholars. In such a context, and in the face of the multiplication of mediation tools, could the future of the museum be assured by the evolution of its function? Could we not rather start to see the museum not only as a cultural place, but also as a kind of social laboratory? Such a trend seemed to be taking shape, and the role of museums could be called upon to change, leading them to become convincing art actors in terms of the inclusion of impeded audiences. Isn't the emergence of new disciplines such as art therapy a step in this direction? Thanks a lot.